Hello everyone and welcome. It's officially one o'clock, so we're gonna get started. Uh, just wanted to say thank you very much for joining us today. You know, there's a million other things you could be doing, um, so we always appreciate you taking the time to come talk with us for about an hour today. Uh, we'll probably only spend 40 minutes or so on the presentation and then I'll leave lots of room for questions and answers and having a little chat together today. Um, there is a question panel on the right hand side of your little control panel there. Uh, feel free to drop any questions into that box. I'd be really more than happy to answer any of them. I'll probably stop every once in a while and check, um, but I'm for sure at the end going to stop and take all those questions at once. So if I don't get your question right away, don't worry, I will get to it at the end um, when we kind of go through all the questions together. But without any further ado, I will get started here today. So just to give you a little background on myself, my name is Matthew Drashinsky. I, I run marketing here at Myovision, and my background is specifically in artificial intelligence and networks. And I've spent the past about six, seven years specifically on these two topics. The first uh, company I worked for was actually in the telecommunications uh, systems. So that level three internet backbone that you see there, that's a visual representation of the level three backbone that majority of internet users in North America use, well, may not ever knowing about it. Um, on the right is the interstate highways. And you can see just the kind of overlap between these two systems. So both from a network point of view and a traffic point of view, I've been really focused on these subjects and how artificial intelligence and the new technology that is being born from it is going to affect networks, both internet networks and now traffic networks. So this is a topic that, again, I'm really passionate about. Um, again, I, any chance I have to talk to a crowd like this that wants to learn more about it, I'm super happy to do so. And uh, hopefully I can bring you along for the ride and show you why I think it's just such an exciting new development in our space. Um, but before we get started, there's also a poll function here. So I'd love to just get a kind of read on the audience here today. And we're gonna throw this out and it's gonna pop up on your screen so you can answer. Uh, the question is, what best describes the organization or you, if it's just you, uh, and the kind of organization that you work for? So are you or your organization an early adopter um, that's always looking to solve technology using new or solve technology problems using brand new systems? Are you just here to learn to see what's possible? Are you a skeptic that you, know, you think the smart city stuff might work out, but you're not quite sure? Or are you the kind of person that only adopts new technologies when kind of you're mandated to do so? So feel free to answer that poll question. We'll get a little sense of who we have in the room and we'll carry on from there. So I'm just gonna leave that poll open and uh, we'll close that out in a few seconds and I'll share the results. All right, we're gonna close that out and share it out. So, wow, yeah, I mean, this is probably what I was expecting a lot of people here to learn. I think it's such a great attitude to have, and hopefully I can satisfy some of those learning requirements that you have today and show you what's both possible and what's kind of already being implemented at the city level. We do have some early adopters out there. Uh, shout out to early adopters, I'm one of you. I love new technology, so can definitely relate to, to that 15%. Um, but then we still have some people that are, are a little skeptical, a few people that only adopt stuff when it's mandated, and. Hopefully we can show you why ultimately this new technology and all these new, new processes and stuff add up to something that's worthwhile and worth kind of your time and worth looking at. So let's close out that poll. We'll go back to the presentation. So I'm gonna call this now the no jargon zone. So I just Googled IOT, I Googled AI, and I Googled smart city. And these were the thing, three things that came up. So. As part of my webinar invite, I promised that I was gonna not use any buzzwords. I was gonna to try to keep it jargon free. I was gonna to try to keep it really well grounded in what's happening today. So beyond this point, I'm gonna try my best not to use these terms um, in the jargon typical way, but instead I'm gonna to try to explain this stuff in a really tactical and in a way that really applies to the work that we're doing today. So I'm gonna try my best from this slide forward to be in the jargon free zone. and. If, uh, if you catch me using jargon, feel free to shout it out using the question panel and hold me accountable. 
I think this really drills into the philosophy I have. And I think this is where we get into a lot of the issues where people don't make a lot of these jargony terms real. And I think a lot of, a lot of the friction happens in the idea versus the application. And for me, I really truly believe that smart cities aren't born, that they're built. And they're built on average work days. So it's no, there's no special day of the week that we're building smart cities. They're built to solve standard problems. So we're not trying to, you know, we're not building technologies and having them try to find something to fix, but instead we're using technologies to actually solve problems. And they're built by, you know, existing staff trying to do something different. Again, I haven't heard from anyone, and if there's someone out there on this webinar that can uh, can offer a different opinion, but I haven't heard of anyone hiring extra people to deal with the smart city initiatives. So how do we work on things that are being called smart city right now in a way that we can work on them every day, that they're solving our everyday problems, and we're using our existing resources, people, and talent to solve them? The smart city can't be something that just appears overnight. It has to come from the collective efforts that we're working on day to day. And that takes the smart city out from being this thing that happens sometime in the future where you do this massive smart city thing and it's all jargon and buzzwords and this like golden paradise that everyone wants to get to one day. But in the meantime, the whole time you're going out to build that thing that's gonna arrive maybe one day, you're incurring risk. So is all this cost that we're incurring, all this time that we're spending, is it actually gonna pay off? Well, we hope so. I think the more practical approach to smart cities is not waiting for that inflection point, but instead investing in solving problems and solving real problems today, installing technologies and using technologies that immediately have an impact on your city and having those small things and those, those things that solve real problems add up to a smart city in the end. So let's get smart city out of that picture. If you close your eyes and think smart city, you probably picture a map with lots of nodes on it and connections and IoT written all over it. Let's 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 stop thinking about the smart city as that and start smarting, thinking about the smart city as being how we adopt new technologies to solve the everyday problems that we have with running and managing cities and for us running and managing traffic networks. The other thing that I, I still see happening with our industry is the evolution of how we actually apply technologies. So I'll wait for this gift to start over. This is called the transformation of the desk. And for some of us that are a little bit older, um, we've kind of seen this happen over time, right? You used to have all these single purpose pieces of technologies. You used to have maybe a, a computer that sat on your desk and didn't move. You used to have your fax machine, Rolodexes, maybe you had, yeah, a globe maybe at one point or maps. And slowly over time, we've seen these single purpose function devices be absorbed into your laptop, into your cell phone. So whereas you needed a niche piece of technology for every single different thing that you wanted to do, the smarter and more and a progressive approach is to look for one set of technologies that work together, so they're built on open principles that allow you to, to consolidate the amount of things that you own and the amount of systems that you have into a really manage, easy to manage, easy to administer, easy to procure um, thing that you can you know install in your city or, or buy for your city to help your city. So I think the same evolution of, of the desk is occurring right now also in our in the ITS industry. I can see that the intersection itself is becoming more like a smartphone or more like a laptop where we're not adding physical components for every use case anymore but instead we're adding software functions that again solve more problems. So again, getting out of that smart city jargon message and into, okay, the smart cities actually needs to be built on platforms that take hardware and run software applications on them. And that way, the next thing you wanna to do to help your city becomes just a software application, not more additional capital expenditure on hardware. So how does that get us to today's topic, which is about artificial intelligence? So, just like smart cities, artificial intelligence is also somewhat of a buzzword, a lot of people talking about it. Um, but I think one thing that I, I personally feel strongly about is telling the story behind the technology and saying and giving really good examples of how that technology is currently helping solve real problems, not just 
a proof of concept here, a demo there, or just again, where it's written on a website. So two things I wanna cover, um, just for those of you who don't know, that's Baymax, he's a friendly helper AI robot um, from Pixar. I wanted to call, actually talk about what AI is, and not in like a jargon sense, but in an actual application sense. And why I think AI is about helping, not hyping. So give examples of what AI is actually doing instead of just throwing it on the screen and saying AI is awesome. So let's start with this exercise. Um, this is actually a, a recording from our system. Just go ahead and try to count the pedestrians that are kind of appearing within that scene. Um, as the GIF restarts, it will come up. Pay attention to the upper right quadrant when you start to see the pedestrians move in. Um, humans, we, we have a ceiling on the things that we can do and observe at any one given time. And in a scene this complex with this many pedestrians moving in this many directions, this is where we need to start relying on technologies and new systems to actually manage and um, really ultimately make decisions in this kind of environment. So in this scenario, if you were trying to go and count pedestrians, if you're trying to do something like traffic counts at this intersection, the odds of being able to do that with any sort of accuracy without some sort of computer assistance would be very, very low. So this is a perfect application of when we take something like AI or take something like a new technology, apply it to an existing problem, which is, hey, we need to manage this intersection. We need to get information from this intersection and use these new technologies as a tool to solve that problem. So not some futuristic thing, let's use it to solve this everyday problem. And the way that we teach computers to do that is very similar to the way that we teach children to recognize objects as well. So I, I don't have kids, but I have lots of nieces and nephews. Um, and I think anyone who's been around kids hears the question, what's that? Or why? Quite a bit. Um, and that's because kids, when they're trying to build these links between what they're seeing or what they're hearing and what's in the world, they need information to make those uh, connections. So if a kid sees a car, he may ask, what's that? And you say, well, that's a red car. The kid might go down the street a little bit more, they might ask, what's that? And you say, well, that's a truck. And what you're, lab what you're doing is you're taking the attributes of that thing that that kid's seeing, and you're saying, the collection of what you're seeing, we call a car. The collection of parts that you're seeing, we call a truck. And this, it's because it's learning. It's, it's a, the kid is genuinely learning for the first time how to take what it's seeing and apply information to it, so then the next time that, ki that kid sees it, the kid says, I know that's a car. And I know that's a car because I've seen a thousand cars and that one looks enough like the next car I'm seeing to know that. It's essentially what we do with teaching a computer to see. So take this white car, for example. If you were, if you were analyzing this car, you would say, well, it's got a certain length, it's got a certain height, uh, and a certain width. So we kind of know the dimensions of the vehicle. We know that it's got four wheels. That's gonna be pretty typical. We know it's got a thing on the front, kind of looks like a windshield. And we say that white thing is a car. Checkbox, we tell the computer. Computer, the next time you see something, that previous thing you saw is a car. So now the computer sees this thing, it's a red car. It says, well, you know, it's a little bit different. The wheel's in a different place this time, but it's close enough. It's got a similar height. It's got still got some wheels and windshield. And the computer says, based on all the other cars that I've seen, this is enough like a car that I agree, and I'm gonna constitute this as a car. But the cool stuff happens is when you do something like introduce something like a concept car, and you say, wow, this looks really different than any other car I've seen, but hey, it's still got a windshield, the height's okay, four wheels are missing and the, the length is weird, but you know, I think that's still a car. And I think even if you show that car to a person or even to a child that's learning what cars are, they would still know that's a car because the attributes are so similar to all the cars that it's seen before. This is the exact same way we teach the computers to see, and this is the exact same way we apply the recognition of our classes to what we see in the real world. So for us, this is how we actually label for our systems what constitutes a car, what constitutes a pedestrian, and what constitutes something like a single unit truck. What we do is just like we teach the child to see, 
is we teach the computer to see. So we outline all these vehicles and we tell the system, this is a car, this is a truck, and this is a person. And the, the system then applies this knowledge and what it's learned against everything else it sees in the future. And what you end up with this, this is a this is called a cluster graph. And I think this is like, this is one of my favorite things. And like I know that's super nerdy, but I actually love this graph. Um, the blue and the orange are cars and the background of the actual scene that we're seeing. And what we're doing there is the clusters represent likeness. So things that share common attributes. So the blue is this swarm of blue that we see in the middle is all the things that the computer sees and says, I think this really looks like a car, this swarm. And some of them will look different, so it's not a single point. So they all kind of look differently, which is why it's a swarm, but they all kind of form this beautiful cluster of things that look like cars. Same thing with the background, the background looks like the background, but then you got pickup trucks in the red. So it's something that's a, a little bit of a bigger vehicle. And what I really think is cool is you kind of get this bridge between them. So you get things that are clearly cars, things that are clearly trucks, and you have a bunch of weird vehicles in the middle that, well, it's not exactly a truck, it's not exactly a car. Um, maybe that could be like your El Camino that is kind of like a hybrid of both. But the computer itself is still taking all that information before, and even though it's close, it's saying, you know what, this is closer to that car cluster than it is a truck cluster, and it still classifies it as a vehicle. So this is how we teach the system itself to train on all the different transportation classes that we use day to day while we're trying to make traffic decisions. And the beautiful thing about it is each time we label it and each time we teach the computer to see or see better, we can apply all that learning to all the future use cases. So as it learns, it gets better, it can do the classification over time. Before I go on again, like to make this even more concrete is the difference between models and algorithms. So again, when people use AI, they kind of turn, again, they use it in like the broad sense, like our AI does this. In a more technical sense, AI is actually comprised of a few different components that achieve the use case. One is the model. So the model is probably what's traditionally most referred to as AI. That's the actual deep learning analysis where we train. So the training is what we had just, just talked about. And it's what identifies and classifies things like vehicles, pedestrians, and cyclists. So the AI and the model is basically the computer vision algorithms that are making those decisions on what is what in the scene and tracking them. Algorithms, on the other hand, um, are, are exactly what do that tracking, lane assignment rules, and the movement uh, qualifications of what's happening with the model. So whereas the models are trained, that's the actual deep neural network AI working, the algorithms themselves, they're defined and they're built by engineers that then put the scene into context so we can actually achieve use cases. And the algorithms are the ones that are the things that do things like either count vehicles, classify vehicles, detect vehicles, actuate for them, et cetera. So computer vision and AI is, is somewhat of a gross oversimplification of all the technology behind the scenes here, which is the computational power of the models which is the deep neural network and the analysis, combined with a bunch of engineering work to make that model actually do something. So again, AI and these kind of smart C initiatives, they're not just about building models that can classify or see, it's about how do we make that actually turn into a use case and build something on top of that technology. So if you take detection, for example, uh, this is a scene from, from one of our cameras you have a few things happening. So you have the model, which is the actual deep neural network, that's the AI. It's identifying the objects and what's happening in the scene. So it's saying, I think that that's a light vehicle and I think those two shapes there are pedestrians. That's what the model's doing. The algorithm is what's determining, what's determining what happens with that information and what is happening in the scene. So the detection boxes that are kind of drawn around there that's the algorithm is saying, okay, I'm seeing a light vehicle and I'm putting it in this lane. I'm seeing these pedestrians and I'm saying, okay, they are walking and we're gonna count them as crossing the, the crosswalk. And these two things working in parallel are actually the technologies that enable the system. And what's really cool about it is a lot of other technologies may do something like 
well, we see pixel differences in this box and therefore we're gonna assume something is there and we're gonna throw a detection actuation on that box. But if you're not actually assigning vehicles to lanes, you could have a big vehicle that shows up here in the front. It makes, a, it makes its way in, out of that bounding box and shows up in the upper detection zone and you might get actuation across both zones just because the pixels have changed in both zones. By actually recognizing using the model what kind of vehicle is here, and then using the algorithm to tie it just to one lane, you don't run the risk of actuating across these different zones. The intersection itself knows what's at the intersection and knows where it is, it's not guessing. It's the same thing with if you're trying to do counts and turning movement counts. We don't create any artificial data or synthetic data about entry and exit points because we don't see it at one point and see it at another point and make an educated guess about where things are. We actually track things through the scene and our algorithms are the ones that track those models in action and provide the counts. So making the technology real and showing it how it actually affects what we call smart intersections. So a smart intersection, again, probably another buzzword, but this is how we define those things. So um, it's aware, an intersection actually knows what's happening at it. It's creating data, it has connectivity, it can actually sense patterns and do some analytics on top of that, and it's integrated, so it's open. So you can start connecting intersection to multiple things within your city. So let's look at it in action. So why it matters. So we just talked a little bit about the tech, a little bit of the, the kind of mechanics behind the scene. That was my attempt to make it more real and less jargony. Uh, what I wanna do now is to show you it actually in action at the city. So again, the topic of the webinar was how AI is already changing cities. Portland, Maine is a really good example of this in action. So I'm gonna walk through what we're doing in Portland and how Portland is using artificial intelligence right now to solve some of the traffic problems. So this is the intersection itself. This is actually just our, our telemetry dashboard within our product. Um, this, this intersection, Portland had been struggling it for some, with some time. It's a very large intersection, very difficult intersection to manage. Um, and they have been struggling to get any sort of detection and actuation at this intersection for what they say is, is close to two decades. So a very, very difficult intersection from a technical point of view to get working correctly. And this is actually off one of their interstates. So a major problem for citizens in terms of congestion as well. So this is kind of the, the view from the top. Uh, I have just two different colors there to represent the two different kind of cameras that we're covering at this one intersection. So we use what's called the TURL um, requirements for video detection performance. And that TURL certification answers how well do you perform in good visibility, good weather at a standard intersection. So the TURL standard is really, really great to actually understand when and where um, intersection performance in terms of detection and actuation is performing well. Um, the, the challenge with TURL is it's typically done in a lab environment. So in ideal intersections and an ideal size. And in talking to lots of customers and lots of people who struggle with traffic problems, the amount of time I hear, hey, I have an ideal intersection in an ideal you know, condition with no weather, and we never have snow, we never have heat, we never have rain, uh, those intersections just typically don't exist. So our goal is to take something like the TURL certification, which measures performance and, and our, um, let's say, it, our accuracy in terms of detection and actuation out of the lab. So out of those ideal con con conditions and actually apply them to every intersection that we're deployed at. So how do we start generating accuracy data in real time and show our customers how their intersections are performing so they can see our technology in action? So this is actually another screenshot from our system. And this was at that intersection that we deployed at in Portland, Maine. This was the first revision of our software that we deployed. It was model five. So we call each different version of our artificial intelligence, those models that we talked about, uh, a different model number. And model five saw 97.3% real world accuracy, which is a really good number. Like that's still really high for the real world, considering that most of these Turtle certs are 98 plus percent in the lab but still not good enough. We, we definitely wanted to, to be higher than that. We wanted to beat the Turl score in the real world. So along comes model six. Model six was the next version of our artificial intelligence. Again, those models that we talked about. 
And model six had taken everything that it had learned from model five and built on it. So we trained it more. We taught it things about this intersection and many other intersections to improve its performance. And after model six came out, you see the exact same intersection with the exact same hardware with just the software update bumped up to 98.3% real world accuracy. And that's higher than the Turtle cert or qualifications actually in the real world. So this intersection is now learning over time and getting better with each update. And we actually, uh, after that came model seven, which again, jumped it up to 98.4 real world accuracy. Um, again, just continuously teaching the system and these intersections to be smarter. So one of the beautiful things about having the ability to teach computers new information is that you can target things where things aren't going well or where you've got a really big intersection or really difficult intersection and teach the intersection new things about its environment. Now that's great for that intersection. Obviously that intersection is gonna work better if you teach it about that particular intersection. But the really, really interesting part is when you take that learning and spread it across all of your intersections, or let's say all the intersections across North America, and you share all those learnings to every system. And now you've got a network that is learning together and collectively getting better rather than just spot solutions in the city that are doing something independently. So this is how artificial intelligence is actually changing cities today. It's taking, taking these challenges, which is, hey, my intersection that I haven't been able to get working from a detection point of view for 20 years is just not functioning, to, hey, the AI and these systems are actually learning about my infrastructure. They're learning about my city. They're getting better, and they're teaching intersections all over North America how to do it better while making this particular intersection better as well. I think that's really, really exciting. And how, it's how we end up with you know, having not only the visibility to, to show customers exactly what our accuracy is, so the transparency to do so, but to show our customers so they can have confidence that the solution that they're deploying at the roadside is serving its purpose and actually working in the real world. So I recorded this, this is from the two cameras. Um, this is the system working after model seven. So again, everything's being very nicely classified. This zones are being detected and actuated. Um, both cameras are working in synchronicity with each other. Um, this is what the actual technology looks like in, in the real world after we start you know, pushing these updates and have configured the intersection. And, and uh, yeah, it's providing, providing actuation and detection in this use case. So this, this cyclical nature of, of what's happening with these intersections means that we're, we're getting data back from all these mild vision enabled intersections and we compare them against what we call golden data sets. So you might be asking, okay, so 98% accurate against what? So what we do is we create what we call a golden data set where we actually manually count and annotate a section of video from that intersection. And we know what the ground truth on that video is by doing that manually. So we have, we have people here that do that manual effort to create what's called the golden data set. And then every time we release a new model, a new version of the artificial intelligence, we train it against that existing or that, that, uh, that data set. So the, the cool thing about artificial intelligence is, you know, each time, you're, each time you make an iteration, before it goes live, you have the ability to test it against everything it's done so far. And that's where these golden data sets allow us to actually compare and to get an indication to say, hey, it's what we're teaching the intersection, making it better. From there, the engineers will actually apply those algorithms, make those changes, train, and then we redeploy back to the intersections. So this is, this is a positive feedback loop, right? So each learning, getting better, learning, getting better, learning, getting better. And that's how we end up, even in difficult situations, having the tools to be able to address them and to make things better over time. And again, provide the visibility to actually show how well we're doing instead of saying, hey, trust us, you know, we're doing well. The analogy I always give is if you had an investment banker or you're working with a, you know, someone, a financial planner, and every time you ask them, hey, am I making money? They were like, oh yeah, just trust me. You don't need to see your account balance. I'm just, yeah, we're, we're making stacks together. You probably wouldn't trust them, right? You probably wanna verify and know just how exactly well you're doing financially. I think that we should be able to do the same thing for the data that we generate. I think we should be able to do the same thing with the services that we provide, actuation, detection, we need to provide that visibility in how we're doing so our customers know the level of service that they're getting and our system has the opportunity to learn and get better. 
So I'll let you, I'll just, maybe I'll be quiet here for a second and I'll let you read this quote. But I think this speaks to the ability of the system. And I think this speaks to the really awesome parts of artificial intelligence and this new technology coming to the city is actually solving these problems, right? We talked at the start of this webinar about the smart city not being born one day, not being just created, but being being built by people who are trying to solve problems. And I think, you know, this particular example of, of the city of Portland trying to solve this problem that they've been dealing with for a really long time and then deciding, hey, I'm going to take a shot at a new technology and a new approach to do so, that's the smart city and that's the smart city in action. So really, really proud to, to be working with the city of Portland and I think they're a really awesome innovative customer. The other thing that, that allows us to do is we, we have, what I showed there is an example from the our, our permanent product, which we call Traffic Link. Um, we do have a portable product as well that it's called MyVision Scout. And it uses the same principles for collecting data, only in this example, we're gonna be doing it in a portable way. So whereas our permanent product is tied to the intersection, it would actually be installed at the traffic cabinet. Our portable version gets ratchet strapped uh, typically somewhere just outside the intersection, sets up in about five minutes, you record video on that device, you upload it to our software and we send you back traffic data. So whereas one platform kind of happens permanently at the roadside, MyVision Scout is about getting all that data back and using the AI and using all that computer vision that we had talked about only without it being fixed. So this is portable, you move around your city, you can do different studies, different times of day, but again, it's out there to use all this new technology to collect traffic data. So again, rather than relying on people to go out to lawn chairs and do manual counts or tubes or another technology, you can get all the pedestrians, you can get the tracking, you can get the movements, you can get travel time reporting, all from a portable unit as well that you kind of set up, you put out there, you turn on, and you can kind of forget about it, come back, collect it, and we help you organize all that in software as well. So a different application of the technology, but again, back to this idea of collecting traffic data, producing traffic data in a really highly automated way, but keeping that extremely high quality, but keeping it easy and safe so we can still make a really big impact day to day. So how does, how does this data actually flow? So we're, again, a lot of people, and I hear all the time that the smart city is about data. In a practical way, how does data actually make its way out of something like data collectors and sensors and into the smart city? I think this is like the practical model to do so. So at the core of everything, you have data collectors. So this could be uh, a business that just does data collection, or it could be a section of an engineering firm or a city that does data collection specifically, or it could be all the sensors. So again, you're gonna have lots of sensors in your city, air quality sensors, you have noise sensors, you can have traffic sensors. They're gonna work in conjunction with these either businesses that are private or these different functions within the city to collect a bunch of data, right? So there's a function at the core, which is we need to get data. From there, at least what I see is a lot of the changes being made flow then through engineering firms or city ops or city engineers. So all this data actually goes not to computers that make decisions, but to people. People who are trying to solve, again, everyday problems. So starts with data, goes to people who know how to solve problems. Those people then make decisions to make their city and their networks better. They'd make changes, and then that is what creates citizen and city impact, and that's what we call smart city. So again, really practical, but it's already the things that we're doing today it's just leveling that up and saying, okay, as we're making changes to our traffic networks, as we're improving travel time and reliability and we're improving level of service at an intersection, how do we communicate out to the world those things that, hey, we are making a big impact here, we're helping citizens, and we're being part of the smart city uh, by making these awesome changes to our traffic network. So my last question again, before I kind of go into Q&A here, would be to just talk and say, you know, what problems are you actually trying to, to solve? So again, I, I talked a few different ways about applications of the technology and, and some of the ways that our customers are using it. We'd be really interested to hear for you, from you what you're looking to do. So are you interested in getting data 
And does that data look like volumes, class, turning movements, pedestrians? Like, is that the interest? Are you interested in maintenance and operations? So are my traffic links, are my traffic signals on or off? Are they experiencing power loss? Are my detectors broken? Are you interested in using data to optimize and actively you know, manage your networks? So are you gonna use data and automated traffic signal performance measures to do so? Or are you more interested in detection and actuation, actually supplying your intersection with detection? Um, really interested to kind of throw that poll out. I'll let everyone answer and I'm interested to see back just kind of what problems you're looking to solve using this new technology. All right, we'll close that out and we'll uh, share the results. I'm really interested to see what this is. So, yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. So a lot of interest still in data, which is really interesting. So a lot of people still looking for TMCs, PEDs, volumes. Um, that makes sense. That's always a need. And certainly new technologies can help with, with making that easy and automated and accurate. And then also a lot of interest around ATSPMs, which again, ATSPMs are one of my favorite topics in the industry. I, I love the idea of optimization based on data. So for anyone that, that's looking for more on that, maybe I'll get uh, my colleague here to share uh, clear signals or, or link to clear signals um, if you wanna learn more about that specific topic. That's our resource on actually using ATSPMs if you wanna go a little bit deeper. And then below that I see we've got using data to actually manage my traffic network. That's cool, That that's like your you know, getting to, to your comms, kind of Tismo, um, you know, actually managing and knowing when and where your signals are offline. And then a few people still on detection and actuation, which is, again, that's that's the more practical use case of the technology, whereas the other ones are far more, I would say, about using data to optimize the city. So, I mean, like, it's my own personal view that you can make a very strong case that all four of these problems and solving these problems and using technologies to kind of get the things that you're talking about on this list um, all roll up to smart city impact. And it's it's the work that's being done to solve these kind of problems, the everyday things that we have to do to, to make our city and our traffic networks run that add up to being that incredibly important smart city, city thing that everyone's talking about and everyone wants to know more about. So that's that concludes kind of the content I have today. Um, but I, I really am looking forward to this being a little bit of a discussion. So in the bottom panel, you have the question box. I'm super happy to take any questions that you might have. If it's um, a question about technology, I'm happy to answer that. If it's a question about where you, if you wanna know where AI is going next or, or any of this kind of uh, future looking things, happy to answer any questions there. So I'm just gonna mute myself. I'm gonna take a quick look at the questions, feel free to submit them and I'll be back in two seconds and I'm gonna start answering some questions. So I've got, I'm just gonna start going through the questions here. Um, I got a few from from Robert Kelly, who's asking, I guess it was kind of a question about, can we use this technology to know kind of the origin and destination and where people are going? So the answer is yes. I mean, the, the, the ability to count pedestrians, to recognize vehicles, and be able to, to kind of say, this is the movement that they've been going at, we count between these zones that we can configure at the intersection. So yes, it's entirely possible to use this technology and, and honestly, both in both ways. So from a smart intersection point of view, you could have that data always being collected. And from a portable way, if you want something that you just wanna take around your city and get that information back on points of the city that aren't or don't have that full connectivity yet, then we can help with the uh, portable version as well. Um, so a question about kind of uh, traffic jams or, or kind of like 
pants lights, okay. Yeah, so uh, I guess, so Robert, I just see that you're having a few more questions about kind of using data and using the system to kind of improve traffic or some particular issues like within your city on particular apps. I would say that certainly there's a few different tools that can help you there. So number one is definitely having the full count information for knowing what classification and how people are using the intersection. I would say the other thing that would solve probably more of your congested relation related questions would be to start using or looking at using ATSPMs, those signal performance measures that will give you some sort of indication. So I know here that you wrote that you had something that looked like a bad left turn or a left turn that was not um, behaving properly. Using signal performance measures and looking at the data from signal performance measures will let you know if, is that a time of day issue? Is the signal controller performing like you had planned it for it to do? Is there movement or extra green time on a movement that you could take away and add to that left-hand turn movement? Um, ATSPMs on the analytics side should help you answer some of those more specific questions. But again, if you do have particular areas of your city, feel free to reach out and we can connect you with someone that can help you diagnose some of those issues. So really, really cool question. I, I really like it. Um, can we, could you use AI to optimize signal timings and can we teach the AI to recognize congestion? Um, the answer to that is we, we don't do that today. The answer to that is probably we would do that in the future or there could be that potential in the future. Now, I will say that in all of my experience in working in this industry, a lot of this work comes down to the discretion and the good judgment of traffic engineers and traffic professionals. And I think it's really about giving them the tools that they need to, to make their traffic network better um, and to be able to make that really local decision about how to improve their city. So technically possible, maybe, but I think that we're, we're probably a really long way from that because you know I think a lot of this still comes down to discretion of the traffic professional. And I don't think you can take that traffic professional out of the equation. Um, so I have a question here about safety um, and kind of the, the roadmap on safety analytics. Another really great question. Um, so the safety analytics that we've we've done work in the past that we've done has been with Mile Vision Labs. So feel free to, if you Google the world's smartest intersection, or maybe I'll have my colleague link the world's smartest intersection. That was a pilot that Mile Vision Labs did with Detroit that went over some of these more futuristic use cases around using pedestrian data to do so. Myovision Labs is the kind of R&D research arm of Myovision that works on our more bleeding edge use cases. So right now, all the safety kind of analytics and that work is being done within Myovision Labs. Now, the cool thing about that, though, is it's still being done on all our existing hardware and being done on the algorithms that we already use for the other use cases. So although it's a new application of the technology, it's not a brand new technology. So it is on our roadmap. It is something that we are focused on. It's something that we're currently working with select customers on trialing. So you can call it more of a, a beta or an alpha version that's out today. But certainly as we get closer to having something that's uh, commercially more available to be installed across different cities, we'll share that update and, and probably host another webinar on safety as an individual topic. So just a question about the the, the benefits that Portland got from the installation of that system. So again, like the, the benefit for Portland was that they could not get that intersection to be um, fully actuated or to have actuation on every approach for, for years. And they could usually continuously, because they just could not get the intersection to perform mechanically, continuously had delay and level of service issues at that intersection. So by adding detection, they were able to put in the plan for the intersection that they actually wanted to have, ensure the controller was actually performing that correctly, and then, um, yeah, measured the impact to make sure that, you know, their intended consequences were, were actually happening at the intersection. So for Portland, it was about solving this very difficult problem that they've been struggling with in a, in a new way, just saying, hey, we've been struggling here. Um, I think it's time to try a new technology and do something a little differently. Um, so this is a question around the, the golden data set or what we call the ground truth data. Um, so again, that is that is annotated video that we use for that. So 
we actually manually annotate that video. So that's how we get the ground truth is we actually manually watch the video, we annotate pedestrians, cyclists, um, vehicles, and then after that we know what 100% truth looks like and then we compare all results against that golden, golden data set. Um, another question about that golden set, do you, do you encounter any human error in creation of the golden data sets? I mean, um, I don't, I don't believe so. I mean, I guess there, there is a chance for, for there to be human error there, but honestly, those golden data sets are so important and there's so many people looking and relying on them here internally that they're just under immense scrutiny. So, although even, even though it could be likely that someone could get a count wrong or an error wrong, the odds of someone else coming in and seeing that and correcting the annotation are pretty high because again, we're relying on those golden data sets for our own accuracy standards. Uh, so this is a, a really cool question, um, really smart question about how the system handles two cameras. Um, so the, the the cameras from the computer's point of view essentially merge into one view. Um, so counting and doing doing that across two cameras is something that we're still currently working on, it's still something that we're currently developing, but essentially the way it works is uh, you kind of combine views into one view. And to the computer, they just kind of see one 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 information plane. Uh, question here about what performance measures can our system provide? So great question. Again, I think uh, my colleague probably already linked to clear signals. There's also another resource um, that we call the ATSPM flashcards, uh, which go through each single one of the single performance measures, how we use it, uh, what it means, and it's an uh, educational resource as well. So I'll have uh, my colleague here also send that out and that could be uh, super useful for you. Oh man, I, these questions are amazing. I could just like sit here and answer these questions all day. So how important will edge computing be um, for wide scale adoption and smart city applications? What an awesome question. So I think it's gonna be really, really important for any connected vehicle use case. So uh, at as part of the World Smartest Interception project that we did with Detroit, we had the opportunity to work on a bunch of connected vehicle stuff uh, where we use Comsignas, DSRC antennas, um, and onboard units outside of the Kobo Center in Detroit. And what became ex exceedingly clear to me while we were doing that with those proof of concepts is if you want to be able to recognize where pedestrians are at the intersection in real time and connect that information to connected vehicles and tell them about the presence of cyclists, other vehicles, and pedestrians for alerting purposes, that has to be done immediately. At the edge, no latency, right? So the edge compute stuff, I think, is really, really important for anything that involves a critical risk on real-time information. So anything autonomous, autonomous connected vehicle related, for sure. I think doing that at the edge from video allows you to say, we're gonna count all pedestrians and not rely on say pedestrians having a phone in their pocket or having some sort of app that they're carrying around, but actually do it from the camera. Um, and that allows you to do those real time use cases. So the edge is an important. If you're just collecting some, some historical data, you can refresh that data in one minute, two minute, five minute, 10 minute bins, that, that doesn't really matter. But anytime you're trying to communicate, especially in connected vehicle, you have to have something at the edge. You have to be doing that processing in real time and you have to be able to communicate in a way that matters to the vehicles around. Great question, love it. Oh, so this is a really good question about counting clusters of people. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting concept like counting platoons. So how do we, how do we count platoons of, of people moving um, rather than just individuals? At the moment, we don't do any sort of platoon or group counting. We count the individuals. So yeah, it does rely on those individual pedestrian uh, tracking mechanisms and counting mechanisms to get data. But I, I have heard that in the past, it's interesting. A uh, question about the biggest bottleneck preventing wide scale adoption of smart city applications. Oh man, there's so many different ways to answer that. Um, one would probably be, there's still a lot of closed and proprietary infrastructure and protocols that exist in today's market that don't allow cities 
to innovate as quickly as they could. So a lot of people are still relying on closed uh, vendors that say, hey, if you want a feature, I have to build it. You can't plug anything on top of me. So there's a lot of like barrier in terms of just, can I get connected? Can I plug things into the controller? Can my cabinet be like mine to experiment with? That is certainly a barrier. I would say the other thing that's preventing like wide scale adoption of smart city applications is just defining what smart city applications actually means. A lot of people still think that smart city applications are some futuristic thing that will happen one day and everyone doesn't, everyone's still pretty unclear about what smart city applications mean. I mean, it's my personal view and my personal opinion that smart city applications are just the problems that we're already trying to solve. And then talking about those problems in a way that really shows impact to citizens through technology. So um, there's a technical challenge there, but I think there's also somewhat of a social political challenge to say, hey, what, what constitutes a smart city project and how can we elevate the work that we're doing within the traffic space to be more smart city facing? So the mayor and council and citizens know what we're doing in traffic to make their city smarter. Yeah, so the, the question, another question about the golden data set and, and does it grow and, and is that how we add the examples? So yes, and even to expand on that, uh, Ralph, what we do is we actually look for really difficult situations. So we go and we look for storms. We look for rainstorms and snowstorms. We look for glare and shadows. We look for all those really ugly scenarios and we build golden data sets off of those as well. So our golden data set kind of is always evolving and always growing. Um, and we're also always challenging it with really hard scenarios or really difficult intersections or really big intersections or whatever the scenario is. So that way we're constantly teaching uh, the system and the, the AI new tricks and, and new situations. So a question here about, let's call it uh, the, the install requirements. So um, we do work with a, a lot of traffic professional in, in the industry. We have a, a network of um, companies that we work with as partners that could help you install and configure. Uh, we have people here at MyVision that can help you install and configure. So yeah, certainly um, it doesn't require any specialized training. Like so there's no like course. Um, that you would have to get, but certainly we would work with you, our partners would work with you to ensure that you're trained and that you can install at the intersection, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, so how accurate and reliable is the real-time data? So the reliability of the data um, is actually relative to the inputs rather than checked on the outputs. So your question was, do you like fix it later or, or analyze it later for issues um, before you turn analytics? No, like so the process actually works with, we do all the qualification and checking of the quality of the data before it's it's kind of put into the system or, or before the system is configured to collect that data. And then that accuracy is checked against golden data sets. So, Although the post data, so the data that it spits out in terms of analytics, um, isn't retroactively changed, um, it is measured by the quality of the data that went in. I know that that seemed like a complicated answer, but it's more tied to the quality of the data entering the system. And if we can keep the quality of the data entering the system really, really high, then the analytics will be really, really good. So your typical garbage in, garbage out. Our goal is to make the, the information coming in absolutely 100% accurate. So that way, on the other side, the system's producing analytics that are also accurate. Hopefully that explains clearly what, uh, uh, you know, your question. Um, so does MyVision provide APIs? Yes. So again, that's one of our commitments to um, open and to open standards is our commitment to having APIs, allowing our customers to use APIs, allowing the data to flow out of our system. Again, we are 100% committed to open and that definitely involves having APIs into our system or out of our system that allows cities and municipalities to leverage our system to share data and to share the technology across different departments. 
Um, can we get a copy? Absolutely, Brian. Um, you will get a video. You will get the whole presentation and a recording. So you can watch it again. You can share it with your friends or colleagues or, uh, yeah, if you want to put it on with popcorn later, like you can do whatever you want with it. So uh, feel free to check that out. We're going to send you a version after the, after the webinar. Um, question here, where do you believe cities, U.S. governments are in the replacement cycle for traffic or intersection cameras? Um, that's also a really interesting question because there's another challenge I see that's maybe parallel to that, which is there's some intersections with lots of cameras. So cameras that are proprietary. So they're not even talking about replacing cameras. It's about adding cameras for every use case. Um, in those cases, I think that having cameras that are open and cameras that can be leveraged you know, across multiple city departments is really, really important. So you're not going out and just adding more cameras. But certainly I think that these new use cases do require a fidelity of video that's probably higher than a lot of existing systems. And I think a lot of the existing traffic cameras that are out there are probably not 4K. They may not be 360. And to do some of the more advanced counting and deep neural network AI-based use cases, you need a higher fidelity camera. So I think there's probably a delta there between the systems that are installed, being able to output the resolution required to get the granularity of data from the AI system and analytics. A question here, could this system be used to track public bus stop information and allow priority um, for bus schedules? So yeah, we don't do transit signal priority today. Um, certainly it's a capability that we demonstrated in terms of proof of concept with our, with our system, but it's not a use case that we currently support. Um, certainly in terms of like doing counts. So if you are looking to count buses and count those vehicles moving through your intersection, we can help you with that issue. If you're looking to say give priority to, um, as of today, we, we don't do that, but um, that's certainly something that's on our mind as being a future use case. Um, so a question about is do we, what, to what extent can we customize the analytics? Is there a language to be able to do this? Um, so our analytics are configurable, but not customizable. That's probably what I would say. So you can you can change them, but if you wanted to and you want to do more custom stuff on top of our analytics, I would say use our, just use our API and use our raw data. So you can get anything that you get in our interface in terms of just raw information as well. So if you are looking to do something with our analytics that's different or change them, we do provide you the ability to do that from a raw data and API point of view, but within our system itself, um, you can't say manipulate the code behind uh, the, the algorithms. All right, what time? What time we got there? Okay, I got time Time for one more. Um, um, so yeah, a really cool question. Is there a way to combine the use of ATSPMs and scout cameras into one hardware to do both jobs? I think that today, today the answer is no, um, but I do think it's an interesting question to say, in the future, how do these pieces of hardware become platforms that then software runs on top of. So today we have a portable thing and, and we have a permanent version. But it's a great question to say, how do these technologies come together? Not only from a MyVision point of view, but from a industry point of view to the point where, you know, if I wanna do something interesting at my intersection, can it just be a smartphone? That then I install an app and now I'm doing that use case because the hardware is there and I already own it. And again, going back to that image that of that desk that was filled with a whole bunch of purpose-built things, how does the industry continue to move in towards a future where all those things aren't individual boxes and appliances, but are all software running on these hardware systems? So love the question, very, very thoughtful, appreciate it. And I think that's one of the more interesting things to keep an eye on in our industry is seeing how that trend goes and where that evolves to. So that brings us to one minute to close. Um, I want to just thank everyone for the really awesome engagement and all the questions. I think having that conversation is really valuable for me and I really appreciate everyone's really thoughtful and thoughtful input. Um, again, thank you for attending today. If you managed to stick around this whole time, uh, you know, really appreciate your time. As always, um, you're going to get a recording of this after the webinar. Feel free to share it with anyone that you might find uh, who might find it useful. 
And again, as always, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you've got my email and I'm happy to answer any questions after this or continue any conversation. So again, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully we'll talk again soon.